I how hope fast, it never How fast do they usually go? What, how, how, what's like the top speed that an F1 car would go? About at the, the top speed now is between sort of 210 and 214 miles an hour. That's wild. And it's not just the top speed. It's then take a track like Azerbaijan, Baku. They will break from that speed down to 20 miles per hour. Crazy. In an unbelievably short distance mm-hmm. where the G-forces are like three or four times that of an Alton Towers roller coaster. <laughs> So if I you pull in six, survive two seconds. If, <laughs> if, if six Gs go through your head and neck, it no, means your head and neck is six times heavier than it would normally be, and that's going through. So I it's can't not, even go on the stealth at Thorpe Park, and that only goes yeah. eighty. So, <laughs> so it would. In answer to your question, it would break me. I think it would right. quite quickly break me. Hello, and welcome once again to In the Lobby, and we've got a very special guest joining us in the lobby. He is a Formula One presenter, producer, reporter, extraordinary man. You've uh, <laughs> you've done a lot in your time. You're now a co-host of the Fast and Curious podcast alongside Greg James and others. And you uh, do you host the F1 Explains on I your do. own? Yeah, no, I don't do it on my own, but I do host it. Yeah, yeah. and produce that one as well. Check you out. I get I get about it. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, this is Harry, our wonderful co-host. Hello, Harry. It's lovely to meet you. Hello, this is nice Christian. <laughs> Christian, me and you just go go way back. We'd, hence the fantastic introduction. Yeah, hence you <laughs> yes. picked me up in true Ian Chambers big up fashion. Tell us the story. Where well, did it all start? Well, before I got in, into the esports and gaming world and before mm-hmm. Christian got into the Formula One world, mm-hmm. 10 years ago, we worked at a little engine that, engine that could called Knox TV. Okay. So that like, it, there was this big like national launch of like several different local, local TV stations across mm-hmm. the country, right? And we jumped on board... This, this one in Nottingham. I was going to say, that was going to be my next question. Is not, Does Notts mean Nottingham? Yeah. Not Notts as in like... It's Nottinghamshire, I guess, isn't right, it? Okay. Yeah. Nottingham and the surrounding areas. Okay. Correct. Yeah. This I is mean, all you dr- never lived it, do you? <laughs> Wait, so you did you both it. live there? Yeah, we, we both moved there. Oh. Well, yeah, I, 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 you well, were at I'm, uni? Yeah, well, I'm from that part of the world. Oh, so okay. I was born in Leicestershire. Right. All my mum's side of the family are from Nottingham. Okay. And by complete coincidence, I ended up going to uni in Nottingham because the course looked great. Mm-hmm. Sort of wanted to go before. What did you do at uni? Broadcast journalism. Oh wow! So we ended up. Yeah, it was my first ever full time job in media. Probably only your second or third, right? Early yeah, days was, for you yeah. as well. Yeah. And we were TV reporters on a on a local news program in Nottingham, weren't we? Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so it was sort of my patch anyway. But you might be able to tell from Ian's accent. It's subtle. But you're, it's not where you were originally from, <laughs> I was never. And, and funny Very enough, subtle. I moved from London. At, I was living in London at the time. Did you go to university? Yeah. I did an undergrad in English language and literature, then did a <gasps> master's in broadcast journalism. Oh. Sheffield University. But then I heard that the Nottingham Trent University one was really good as well. So it was, uh, mm. it was really cool because that's where we sort of, I, I don't know about you, but I learned so much. Oh. Looking back now. It, it's so much about because we had to do everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we were filming our own stuff, we were editing our own stuff, we were obviously presenting our own stuff, and it was it, it was one of those we were lucky to have it, weren't we? Because it was, really was. Is that at Knots TV? You mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Because I didn't one, realize it at the time. No, because one of those jobs that you get to practice it everything. Yeah. You get to be on air, and it it well equipped you for everything else. Mm-hmm. Like I bet like when you're on stage in front of thousands of people, you or when you're reading auto cues, you know, you got to hone those skills at Knott's TV. So it was one of those jobs that we were lucky to do because it was one of those jobs that just sort of trained you for everything. Yeah. I and mean, in my sort of big first national job in my career, I couldn't have done that without you TV. Without the training yeah. that you'd had, yeah. Exactly. I feel like now that's such a, like, as time's gone on, that's kind of almost like a frowned upon thing in some businesses to be like, when you're applying for a role, it has to be like, this is the role, this is what I'm doing, where mm. actually you, you tend to gain a lot of experience just doing absolutely everything. Absolutely. I it's remember crazy. my first little job, I was working in a bakery, but then I ended up doing, like, just serving customers. I ended up running their website doing their photography, mm-hmm. all kinds. And that's all good stuff to put on your CV. So I, like, I don't mind it at the end of the day. And I think in broadcasting as well. So like when I do events, I, I'm just so aware of everything that goes into making it work. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because we did all the roles behind the scenes as well, you know, like directing, with, you know, sound, whatever well, You was. especially did. Ian was directing programs as well, which yeah. I never had the hand-eye coordination to do. <laughs> and 
You did everything, yeah. So, and you were a very talented cameraman as well. So, yeah, I did do camera work. As yeah, well, yeah you, you, you sort of realise when you go into big productions, what's that makes you be nice to people? It really you never does. We want to be one of those presenters that's a. Am I allowed to swear on this podcast? Yeah. No, we try not to. Oh, right, fine. Yeah, okay. You never want to be a t- one of those presenters that's a total nilly, do yeah. you? Like that's the word <laughs> I was going for. I was going for something that rhymes with hick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you never want to be one of those, do you? You just you, yeah. you know want to be nice to people. So yeah, we we met when we were at the start of our blossoming journeys in Chambers. Is it, isn't it funny though? Because like you know, in theory, we've gone completely separate ways and separate mm-hmm. directions. But in 2024, in, in the landscape of uh, entertainment and media, everything crosses again now, I think. It Just does. The gaming world and, the, and the, uh, the traditional sports, there's so many parallels now. Well, since we... So we started at Knott's TV, what, t- 2014? Yeah. And here we are, 10 years on. Wow. I'm so old, That's yeah. crazy. I'm very old We're both very old. Yeah. The, the gaming world is closer to the sporting world, definitely. 100%. Yeah. The gaming world... Realistically, it's probably as close as it ever was to the entertainment industry, but I feel like nowadays has more respect mm-hmm. in the entertainment industry and people realise... There's that wild stat, isn't there, that the gaming industry is worth more than the film yeah, industry or the, whatever. Yeah, music uh-huh. or whatever else yeah. it is, yeah. And I feel like there is more acceptance of that now. And because of that, the media industry is small. Mm-hmm. Like, it, you know, you know people across everything so yeah you can go away and separate and then again another thing of be nice to people For sure. because eventually you will come end up working with, you'll them, be again. Back with them again like if i'd been a real awful person to ian yeah this interview would be awkward <laughs> but we got on rather well old friend didn't we? yeah, and then when you br- bring me on on case. stage at a big f1 event exactly. i'll say the same <laughs> exactly no but it, it's it is important and i look back to you know we had some ups and downs back then, you know. We don't need to get into it now, but oh you, wow, you, you, spicy! Not, not me, me, no, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, 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 okay. We, okay. I'm genuinely, Woo. we always 100%. got on like a house on fire. Yeah, yeah, there was always that, you know, that natural competition and all that sort of stuff, but yeah. never really between us. Okay, no, I, I, I think, or genuinely, I'd say otherwise. Me and Ian always got on like a house on fire, but like yeah. with any job, especially when you, you know, you're operating with a tiny budget, it was a new thing. You mm-hmm. stress, so yeah, we had some. We had some testing times in our career, didn't we? And and learned from it and came out the other side of it. So, yeah. But how quickly after you guys initially met at Knott's TV, did you then just, like, part ways? Because were you working together for a long time? Yeah. Uh, was it, like, three years? Three years. So oh, okay, we, okay. So yeah. a, a, what, a fair whack of time. I stayed at Knott's TV. We were both there from, we were both there from day one. Like, right. we were part of the launch team. That's before nice. any equipment. It's kind of like us with Guild. Like, we've been here yeah. since the very early days and, like, seen so much change. And it's that's quite nice to have that. Yeah. Cool. And I left after three and a bit years, and you left very shortly after me. Yeah. And we were just having this conversation off air, but we met up just after I'd left and just as Ian was about to leave. Yeah. And we bumped into each other, didn't we, in Lon- in central London when I was then working at the BBC. Mm. But that even that was, well, that was pandemic time, so that yeah. was years ago. So, yeah, we, 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 we've we kept in touch with social media and text. Yeah, and I'll send you a voice message out of nowhere. And yeah, he yeah, loves no, a voice message, but so do I. I mean, <laughs> podcast presenters, you've got to love a voice message. We're yeah. effectively it, doing the professional. It's crazy because I think there's actually been, a, speaking of parallels, like I do feel like there was a parallel between me and you both finding uh, our position in our desired roles, I guess, to a certain degree. Obviously, you know, I'm sure you've still got huge ambitions to go further than you are now, and, and likewise for all of us, but... You're actually in the the place that you wanted to be, right? In in Formula One. Yeah, and that's a really interesting point because I felt with you at the time there was an element of similarity between us. But you, we would, you know, we were working on a news program. Mm-hmm. So we're very different. I was very big, loud entertainment. You were like, oh, let me get the story report. Yeah, and I wasn't. I was. If you were sort of on the entertainment spectrum. On one side and news on the other, mm-hmm. you were firmly seventy five percent towards the end. Sure. You could do a news story, you know, yeah. it, without question. I was probably sixty forty in favour of news, but then I, I, I don't know. I still didn't a hundred percent know where I wanted to be long term. I knew I didn't want to be like Clive Myrie sat behind the desk on News at 10 doing This Is The News. Mm-hmm. But I equally wanted something topical with a journalism tint to it. You especially by the end knew you wanted to go down more entertainment route. And 
your passion for gaming. I mean, you've got a Nintendo tattoo. Like it was, it was always, <laughs> and we spoke a Nintendo. lot about gaming, didn't we? <laughs> we like, did. Like so, I think I think we have found our place in the world because only in the last, I've been working full time in Formula One now for just over a year. So it's, I'm still right. a, a newbie to doing F1 full time. When did you know that was what you wanted to do? When did you kind of... Have you always been interested in F1 in general? Well, or was it? I didn't. That... And I guess you two have probably had the same thing. Because I'm guessing you've both been always passionate about gaming. I certainly mm-hmm. know Ian has Harry. We've only just met. But I'm guessing there's always been the gaming thing. And I'd always had Formula One as a passion. I would have spoken about Formula One when we were working together. Yep. But I always thought I wanted to be a general news and sport broadcaster. Okay. And I did. And I did it for 10 years, basically. I spent the first 10 so years of my career... To a decent level, yeah, yeah, I did, I did all right, and and doing news and sport. But I left my job at Radio One. I used to work doing news and sport for Radio One. I did that for five years, and got made redundant. Um, because just, just sorry to briefly cut you off there yeah. for context. Like there'd be times where I'd be driving <laughs> this this end of the uh, country and the, the, the top end of the country. And I'll just be listening to Radio One, and then I just hear his voice. Like, That's you know, a huge I pop up every hour, <laughs> yeah, with like, the news. It's That's as cool. national that is, as national that is gets. Really cool. you know? It was really cool. It was amazing. Yeah. Sorry, Karen, redundancy. Yeah, well, well, I did that job, and it was a total dream job because that uh, we were just talking about the the balance between news and entertainment. And on Newsbeat on Radio One, you were really mixing that. You were doing the news, and you were doing some big stories, but you were also doing it in an entertaining way because it sits on Radio One mm-hmm. and One Extra and the Asian Network, so you've got to be doing it in a sort of entertaining way. But when I came out of that, I then started, well, I went freelance because I said I had to take redundancy at the BBC because that job moved to a different part of the country mm-hmm. and I couldn't go with it. So I took redundancy, went freelance and I, I worked for some brilliant stations that I've always listened to and love and worked, you know, worked for Talk Sport and LBC, brilliant radio stations that I was a big fan of and did bits of TV work mm-hmm. and, and, but it didn't hit like I thought it was going to. Yeah. It was like, I've done 10 years of the news and, and daily news and sport. And it was a scary realisation of, I, d- I don't want to do this anymore. And it's mm. really scary when you've committed 10 years of yeah. your career to that. And so to answer your question, when I'm going around the house a bit, I appreciate it, which is, <laughs> which is unlikely. But only then did I sort of think, well, actually, there's Formula One, because I've always loved it. But what, do you turn your passion into your job yeah. or is it your escapism? Mm-hmm. And I actually think there's probably a way of doing it for both. I imagine yeah. you guys can be in the, uh, engrossed in the gaming world but still manage to switch off with maybe a different game or something yeah, different with it. Exactly. That's been the thing for me. I still like to use Formula One as a passion mm-hmm. and a switch off, but it is my job. So it was only when I came out of the BBC really and then sort of didn't really get on with freelancing that it was like, it's time to do something completely different. Mm-hmm. And I don't know about anything else. I'm not a very intelligent man or <laughs> knowledgeable man. So it was like, it was F1 or nothing. It uh-huh. was F1 or do something completely different. And I was fortunate that there was two F1 projects that had sort of, people had come to me with that may or may not happen, the two, what ended up in the two podcasts. And I thought, well, maybe if one of these works, maybe there's a, maybe there's a chance I can do it. And I then made the decision in February of 2023 to be like, okay, Let's put all the eggs in the F1 basket. Let's stop doing the news. Let's stop doing sports bulletins. Let's focus on trying to get these two F1 things mm-hmm. off the ground. Unfortunately, they both worked. And I never thought they would both work. <laughs> I thought if one sort of worked, great. And here we are a year down the line. And touch wood. I'm not going to touch the wood because it's going to make noise on the microphone. Yeah. You're not allowed to do that. We've got top of all that. So gently touch wood. They're both working. So, so that's how I decided. And now I'm in. It's like I don't, I don't want to stop this. It's yeah. Once you make the jump. Like, yes. I remember, uh, you know, I was starting to get bits of esports work here and there and gaming stuff, but I was still doing radio at the time in, in Nottingham. Yes. And it took me a lot of courage to, because I loved working in the radio, right? Loved it. I can imagine. You, you, you love, you're like such a vocally like positive and confident person that just, and to me that's well. just like your dream thing is like in and, radio. And I'm a radio geek and he's a, he was very good at it. Very <laughs> Thank you. good at it. But like, it, it, I, I started to realise I'd found something that I loved more than anything else. And like, I was ready to leave radio. I was ready to, to close the book on it. But it took such courage to go, and this is, I'm not talking about myself here, I'm talking about anybody who makes the jump. It's like, okay, I've got a passion here that, and I'm getting bits of work within it. But I'm going to leave this behind. Yeah. This, mm-hmm. It's also financial security to a, yeah. to a certain Oh, it took a massive risk. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I was like, I'm, I'm doing it. And I just jumped. 
And then you get in and you're like, oh, God, I can't, I can't So we both it. did a really similar thing. We did. And yeah. there's an element of us catching up as old friends on air because we've been talking about going for a drink for literally the last six months have, yeah. and not been able to pull it together. Yeah. So, yeah, we've been through a really similar thing of, of because, I, you know, I was on a full-time BBC salary and it wasn't spectacular money, mm. but it wasn't bad. You know, it was, yeah. it was paying for the weekly big shop. So <laughs> it, do you sort of gamble that almost, which I did. You know, I took a massive gamble to, to go freelance in the first place mm-hmm. and, then, uh, and then to actually stop all this regular freelance work because the thing with freelancing in the media is once you once you start saying no other people replace you like that yeah it's scary so we've so had that discussion a, a few times yeah we? it was like a you proper can't s- turn it down yeah yeah it was a proper sort of okay do we do this but i'm so glad i did and now i'll be to you know to your question i'll i'll f1 will retire me i'm sure about that Good i'll man. i'll be in it for as long as it wants me Mm-hmm. Um, and hopefully, fingers crossed, I'm at the start of the journey because I've only been doing it for like, 18 months, but I'm having a lovely time doing it. Plus, it's growing so much. As Huge. someone that's not known, I don't come from any kind of F1 background. In fact, my dad used to put it on the TV when I yeah. was like a kid, and I'd be like, Dad, how can you watch a car driving around a track again and again and again and find it entertaining? But now, like... I still question that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I just think, like, having got more into gaming and just more into, I guess, seeing the merging of sports and gaming, especially with sim racing and stuff, it's bec- I can see how people find it so entertaining. And it's not just necessarily about watching a car drive around around a track. Right. It's just, like, everything that comes with it. You know, there's, like, obviously the drama you get with things like Drive to Survive, which I kind of want to know your opinion on because... As kind of like an outsider, mm. Drive to Survive is such a... It's one of those controversial things that people was like, oh, it's like the keeping up with the Kardashians of like yeah, the, yeah. the racing world. But it is also probably undeniable that that is what's bringing so many new people into yeah, yeah. F1 as well. It's kind of like... It reminds me of... Do you know when The Last Dance came out, the Michael Jordan documentary? I don't know if you ever saw it. But then I found it really difficult to buy a pair of Jordans after that because everybody was like, I need a pair of Michael Jordan's trainers, mm-hmm. right? But like it, it brought a, a, a wider fan base in is yes. that the same with this show there Did is you feel such that? a young like young female fan base for f1 now yeah. especially i see it all over social media so many of my friends are super into it and i, I do wonder like where where has it come from well, like, I, did, I just I, don't know as ian said i did two podcasts f1 explains and the fast and the curious the fast and the curious the majority of its audience is female it's a sport, a UK based sports podcast with a majority female audience. That's, awesome. that's crazy. unheard of. Tapped into something there. And F1 Explains as well is F1's biggest. It's, that's an official F1 podcast. It's F1's biggest female listened to podcast. It's like, so yes, there's a massive female audience. Two things that you said there. The first is, and I'm not just saying this because I'm sat on a gaming podcast. I regularly attribute gaming to being a massive factor in the rise of Formula One, Mm -hmm. because it's not just Drive to Survive. That's been Mm -hmm. a big part of it. But also, in 2019, we had an influx of exciting young British rookies. Mm -hmm. Um, George Russell um, and Lando Norris being a couple of them. And um, Lando in particular, I'm sure, you I don't need to tell you, huge gamer. You know, Mm -hmm. absolutely huge gamer. Um, also, drivers like Charles Leclerc, I think, off the top of my head, started the season before, but still around that era. Obviously not British, but again, big gamer. Max Verstappen, who'd been around for a few a few years at that point, big gamer, currently dominating the sport. And F1, at the same time as a sport, had quite recently changed hands in terms of its ownership and sort of opened the floodgates a little bit. Mm-hmm. So a combination of F1 being more active on social media, combined with these drivers streaming mm-hmm. and bringing in fans with watching them stream, which they still do to this day. Mm-hmm. And again... How do these F1s, proving you can combine your passion with your sort of switch off, how do so many of these great champions switch off? They stream, they game, yeah. they drive. All right, it's a different form of driving, but they do. So the likes of Lando, Max and Charles streaming has been a huge thing. You know, mm-hmm. bringing in their Twitch followers to the sport has been massive. But in terms of Drive to Survive, listen, you know, F1, break it down to its simplest terms, is 20 drivers driving around the track for an hour and a half. <laughs> But the things that come with that, you know, mm-hmm. first and foremost, what they do is superhuman. The mm-hmm. physical demands, mm-hmm. the politics off track, the engineering of the cars. You know, these are priceless feats of engineering yeah. that should really be in galleries somewhere and instead are raced around the world at 200 miles an hour. There's so much to Formula One. And what Netflix have done with Drive to Survive, and by the way, I am completely 
unbiased. I'd work for Formula One, but I, if I thought Drive to Survive was terrible, I'd happily sit mm-hmm. here and tell you it's terrible. No, he would. I th- oh, and Ian knows I'm not backwards and coming forwards with an opinion. No. I think it's brilliant because it's done the best job ever. Listen, we've got brilliant F1 broadcasters in this country, F1 TV and Sky Sports, mm-hmm. the English-speaking F1 broadcasters, Channel 4, they all do an amazing job. But what Netflix managed to do beyond that is, is show what people like me love about it, the internal politics, the stories up and down the field, mm-hmm. the fact that, take last weekend, for example, one of the teams was only t- able to field one car, the drama behind that, They've shown the sort. They've showcased everything around the sport so well. And yes, okay, they take a bit of creative license here and there. But and, and have they gone too far on occasion? Yeah, definitely once or twice. But actually, the last series got that balance fantastically. The season's just out. You know, it doesn't matter if they use a radio message from a different race to convey mm-hmm. a storyline. Anyone who's made media, anyone who's told stories professionally knows you mm-hmm. have to do a little bit of that to tell a story. So they've they've captured what the sport's about so well and brought it to a new audience. And when I was working with Ian ten years ago, we never cross any came across any other F one fans, did we? Nope. You know, I was the only one that would sit there and talk about it. When I was at school before that, yeah. they've made so many more people love the thing I love. Yeah. So I got called on the TikTok the other day. I watched my first Grand Prix in nineteen ninety eight. I got, uh, someone, I dared to have an opinion on a podcast, can you believe it? And <laughs> someone said to me, oh, talking of utter rubbish, drive to survive fan. It's like, well, A, I've been watching F1 since before you were born, mate, so <laughs> let's be careful with your insults. And B, drive to survive fan is not a negative thing. Yeah, if no. you've come into the sport through drive to survive, in my eyes, you're so welcome. Let me show you, I've loved it for years, but let me show you what's brilliant about it. So I, I Drive to Survive's been fantastic. And I don't think I'd be working in the sport without it. Mm-hmm. You know, I do two F1 podcasts. I do a little bit of work covering the races. I do occasional bits with F1 TV, occasional bits with uh, with Five Live, BBC Radio. But most of my work is in the ether around the sports. That wouldn't be there without And the drive learning. Survive. Yes, and, and the learning and, t- and teaching yeah. people about it, particularly mm-hmm. with F1 Explains. It's... F1 Explains is a podcast that doesn't go, right, let's talk about the last Grand Prix. It takes on individual topics and go, right, this episode's about why the drivers are so fit. Mm-hmm. We don't need to talk about the last race. So it's, again, learning, explaining, having fun with the ecosystem around it. None of that would be there without Drive to Survive. Yeah. Just circling back to gaming briefly, obviously in the pandemic, everything was put on, on ice, right? You couldn't really do anything. No live events, everything else. And then sim racing all of a sudden became a huge thing. Where uh, your actual genuine races now, we're all d- having rigs at home, yes. right? Mm-hmm. That must have been a unique thing for you to witness as, a, as an F1 fan. But it, it was, was great. amazing, right? Yeah, it was like, well, but again, we were all looking for something to watch, weren't yeah. we? Be- uh, and especially, I started to. So the F1 season, it used, to, it used to run March to October. Now there's so many races, it runs March, early March until December this year. But by the time the pandemic had happened, you know, we were into June and we hadn't had an F1 race since October. I'm sort of chomping at the bit to watch some Formula. You know, mm-hmm. the thing I love, I've not been able to do for watch for six, seven months. And and cleverly, F1 were like, well, well let's, let's stream. That's the closest thing we can get. So, yeah, they did the, the stream of the F1 sim racing esports and it was fantastic and it went down really well. And the drivers loved it. So it was a it was a great idea. Yeah, yeah. And, and again... That's helped, and F1's kept up. It's I think it ran into a bit of trouble this year, but it's now just got going. But F1's launched its, um, it's, it's continued its sort of esports sim racing journey, which is fantastic. So, yeah, the gaming and Formula One sit really close. Mm-hmm. And yeah. something I can I can say, I raced briefly when I was a kid. I raced for about five years um, in sort of the areas where the drivers started. I was I'm a better presenter than I was a racing driver I'm very realistic about my own talent <laughs> right but I've done a bit of racing and you know the the the, the skills are cross transferable yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It, yeah it is not coincidence you know and we've seen people like I interviewed a guy called James Baldwin who won a competition called World Fast, World's Fastest Game or World's Fastest Race or something like that apologies James or the team if I've got the <laughs> title wrong or something like that and you know he's gone on to race for um, a Jensen Button owned um racing team you know he could he came in through gaming uh sebastian job who's one of red bulls um esports races he has also done 
sim racing setups for the real life F1 team. So he's, you know, when the team were out on the track, he's back at the factory setting up Max's car on the sim. You know, that's the worlds combined. That's what's so good about sim racing, right? If, you know, if, if you're a football fan and you want to be a footballer, for example, playing FIFA is not going to get you there. Great yeah. comparison. But the great thing about sim racing is it is so <laughs> like for like to a certain degree. Obviously, yeah. it, it gives you without that experience. The da- like the without, danger. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've found out we've got a sim racing set up here at Guild now. Mm. Uh, I'll, I'll show you after this. And, uh, you know, when I play it, I'm, I'm always knocking people off the track. Every time <laughs> he it. does not take it seriously at all. We're all in the zone trying to set our best lap, and he's here just like. If I could, I'd drop around. a banana skin and a, and a, <laughs> and a green shell. We should have a crossover. But like that's, you know, I, I actually think that our sim racing setup here is going to be a, a huge success because I think for those people out there that may, you know, be thinking, oh, I really want to hit the track, but number one, it's very expensive. Number two, it's dangerous. You can do a version of yes, it. Yes, you can. And mm-hmm. still feel the, the thrill and exhilaration of it all. And it's like a little thing that new racing drivers always make the mistake with is, is the sort of old-fashioned motor racing technique of slower in, faster out. Mm-hmm. So if you come into the corner, you can slow your vehicle down enough in order to be able to get the foot on the accelerator earlier. So when you're at the end of the next straight, you reach a higher top speed. Slower in, faster out. Sort of a broad motor racing principle. What do people do when they get in and, you know, when they game, they do exactly the same thing. They fly in, they go far too quickly, they go off the track. So it's little things like the slower in, faster out turning. That is the same in the digital world as it is in the real world. Yeah. Again, you don't get that with something like FIFA. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm sure there are some areas where, of course, they cross. But you're right, you know, some of those principles from gaming and in real mm-hmm. life do cross over. And it's oh, I can, yeah. I can score as many goals I want on my left foot on FIFA, but I'm, it's never going <laughs> to... That's never going to translate to real life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's really cool, you know, because like when I like first started looking at sim racing rigs, and I've I've worked a couple of events now with like I worked Player Zero Zero, which is like a Heineken event where they brought these players in from around the world. They were all like really good in their field at sim racing. Some big and names just, there as well, right? Yeah, and, and Max Verstappen was there as well. He came to race with everyone, um, which was insane, and it was just really cool to me because I think it was then it kind of dawned on me how big sim racing had become and the fact that a lot of these people might not get the experience or like the chance to go out and like with FIFA, you can go out and play football if you want to, you can go and play like a five a side or whatever, but it's going to be harder to be able to get yourself onto an actual track and like race a car. So that's where sim racing or just like even being able to have a steering wheel. Like I've had experience with this recently. I, I got myself a steering wheel, not like a sim racing one or anything, just literally a driving one. And I started streaming on TikTok just playing some different driving simulators. And the amount of like young people, especially Mm. women, like I would say probably 80% female, everybody asking me, where did I get the steering wheel? Mm. Like, how can I get one? What driving games can I do? And it's just like, it's blowing my mind how big it's become, especially with that demographic. It's just nothing I've ever seen before. Nothing that was really present when I was playing games as like a teenager either. So it's super, super cool. And I'm glad to see it's like really taking off. And the drivers love those sort of events because they, yeah. they, they, they they genuinely are, but not all of them, but they, you know, the ones like Max are genuinely passionate about yeah. it as well. They, they really enjoy it. And you hit on a thing as well that, that it's not just gaming that's hit more female demographics. The sport seems to as well. I don't really mm-hmm. have an answer as to why no, well, it's, that it's, is. It's so bizarre. I'm sure if someone's going to write a paper on it or something. Yeah, it, 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 again, Netflix are certainly... Help. Yeah, I uh, think it has. I, I, I think, I think, but it's the, it's the stories, and I think Formula One is one of those sports where, uh, it's it's much more possible to get into the stories of the people. A, a little example is so again with the Fast and the Curious, um, the whole premise of that podcast is, or, or certainly was at the start, is that I was the sort of resident F one geek. And my two co-presenters, Greg James of Radio One Fame and Betty Glover, who's a BBC Sport presenter. Betty's a sports journalist; she knows her sport. But she was she would text me about Formula One because she, Betty, knows football, cricket inside out, many sports. But she didn't know F One inside out. So, as a sports fan, she was curious. Greg was really similar. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a passionate cricket fan and therefore mentions it on every episode of the Formula One podcast we do. But again, <laughs> he would, t- you know, so it was, you know. They were very curious about this sport, and I think one of the and, and our producer Jimmy had, had was nothing to do with F one. We you know, we wanted a non F one fan to produce it, and what's hooked all three of them in 
is the sort of human side of the sport, mm-hmm. the characters and the individuals. And I certainly think maybe that's helped with the female audience in particular. Because yeah, yeah, I do think so, because yeah. Because people like stories. Uh, yeah, so it's people a lot like stories, story people telling. like drama. And then if it leads you to supporting, you know, like a team or a player or someone, then yeah. well be it. Well, speaking of support, Christian, you are a, a talented, charismatic and proud gay man. <laughs> Again, the last one of those things is true. Then, uh, that's the one I can confirm. I know that, that you're very proud to be a part of Racing Pride. Yeah. You're an ambassador. Talk to me about, you know, metaphorically waving the flag um, in motorsport. Yeah. Leads into what we were just saying because, because you know, we, on both podcasts we do, F1 Explains and, and Fast and Curious, we, we really try and um, promote the brilliant women working in F1, because historically F1 was a rich boys club. It, going back to its sort of beginnings in the 50s, you, uh, I can talk to you about how the sport started the days, but it, you know, it was mostly rich white men going racing. And we're seeing over time F1 is genuinely doing a very good job, of motorsport as a whole, as to bringing in more uh, women into it. Mm-hmm. And, and that's brilliant but there are, of course, other areas, you know, there's, 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 and this is an issue across the media in general about bringing more people from working class routes into it, um, into the media, uh, you know, bringing people with of different races into it. And F- F1, you know, motorsport has all these challenges. And I think the biggest reason with, with me being gay in particular was I, I first realised I might be gay when I was 14, 13, 14. And at the time, I had a season ticket holder at Leicester City. Another thing me and Ian always had in common, big football fans, and I was obviously a big Hull fan. I was a big Leicester fan, etc., etc. And you were a Hull fan, oh, I made that up. I used to be a Spurs fan. Spurs Do you fan, remember? of course you did. <laughs> yeah. I completely made but that But that changed up. like the wind, you know? Like, sometimes it's Hull City, sometimes it's Tottenham, but... Yeah. Oh, there's obviously was the following... We Hull. weren't working together when Leicester won the league, were we, thank God? Or oh, were we? Yeah, we were. Oh. Because when Leicester City oh. won the league, I'm a big Leicester City fan, I was at Nottingham Forest end of season. Oh, yes. Because I was the sports presenter at the time. Yeah. What a crazy time that was. Because crazy do you time. remember Leicester, Tottenham came second. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It was a horrible time. Yeah, because I came in in a full Leicester kit to wind you up. So we were, <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. So, yeah, so, um, but I remember when I was a kid, uh, being a season ticket holder at Leicester, racing, as I mentioned earlier, being in, in and around sport, and genuinely believing that because I'm gay, I th- at the time I thought I wanted to be involved in sport, probably as a sports presenter, but believing it wasn't possible. I'm 32, so this wasn't a million years. You know, it was a fair while ago, but it wasn't all that long ago. And... I used to drive home uh, from college and listen to Radio 1 on the way home. And there was always, at the same time I was on, there was Newsbeat used to come on at like 5.45. And they had the sports presenter who was always a guy called David Garrido, who I've gone on to meet a few times, a lovely guy. He was always at the biggest sporting events. And I'd listen and think, I bet I can't do that if I'm gay. You know, you, you can't be a gay sports mm-hmm. presenter because there were so few examples back then. There were so few yeah. examples of gay sports people, not just sports presenters. Did that slow you down on, uh, with the process of coming out? Yeah. Massively, yeah. massively. One of the biggest factors was I want to be involved in sport. So we t- talked about my career earlier, going from Knott's TV to going to working at the BBC in the East Midlands to, to doing Radio 1. And it was only when I got to Radio 1 that I'm also um, an ambassador for Fox's Pride, the Leicester City LGBT group. And, and they sort of said to me, brilliant that you're on Radio 1, would you like to be an a ambassador for us? And I, so I was at that time out to my friends, but certainly not on social media or anything like that. And it was like, oh, okay, so this is a choice now. Do Am I out mm-hmm. to the world and I just sort of sat and thought to myself if if I you know then in that position where in a mad turn of events I was doing the sport on Radio 1 it was like if, if I was coming home in the car and knew oh that guy's gay it would help me massively and still to this day I, the first ever time I spoke about being gay on a sports programme was on Five Live Sports about three or four years ago and I got so many messages from people on Instagram. People had never messaged me before saying, oh my God, just hearing a gay male sports presenter just be gay and also be a sports presenter was just mad. So it, it does, I think it does help. So mm-hmm. I'm very proud to represent Racing Pride and Fox's Pride because I just want to show people that you can get into Formula One if, shock horror, you're a woman. <laughs> you can get into Formula One, shock horror, if you might be black or Asian, or something like that. Anything that's different, race. You can get into Formula One if you're gay. You know, I, I just think you can be LGBT plus anything you want to be, 
and still get into sport. Mm-hmm. And it stopped, It did stop me from coming out for a long time. It made that process harder. I think I'd have spent less money on therapy over the years if I'd have been able to get that down sooner. So, yeah, I just want to prove that you can be out and, uh, you know, the, I'm a F1 presenter. I, I, you know, I know my, I'm not a, I come across as self-confident, but I'm not massively self-confident. I can just talk. Yeah. I don't give myself a lot of credit in many areas of my life, but I know my F1, and I know I'm a decent presenter. People have been paying me to do it for long enough now. I must be all right at it. The fact I'm gay is largely irrelevant to that. I, you know, I know my F1, I'm a decent presenter, and I'm gay, and that's possible to be, but I wouldn't have believed that when I was a kid. Yeah. So, And even when I was... When, you know, when I was going to Nottingham Forest press conferences at Notts TV still didn't want it to be known that I was gay. I was nervous about being openly gay. You want to be laddie, laddie, laddie with the gang. Yeah, like. you want to fit in. You'd be a chameleon, don't you? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and again, so I just want to prove to people and show people that you, you can be LGBT plus and be involved in sport. It's really important to me. I think it's amazing. And I think it's incredible. What you're doing is really, really good. It really is. And, and, and it's, I found it fascinating that, you know, humans have existed for however long. Mm. And I feel lucky to be part of the world at this pivotal point over the last 10, whatever, five, 10 years and, and onwards now, where these things are soon going to no longer be an issue. Yeah. And I it's because so. of people like yourself mm-hmm. and others around you who, who, who might have done the same that it just breaks the, the nonsense. Yeah, it's, like, yeah and, and it's just showing that um, a lot of people, you know, you know, F one's had its issues in recent uh, weeks and months with a, you know, with with the team boss Christian Horner of Red Bull having accusations against him, which of course he denies. But there's been a big furore about that, and we we spoke a little bit about that on the podcast. And we had um, an F one TV presenter called Laura Winter talk to us about how it's sometimes felt a little bit difficult to be a woman in F one this season because of everything that's gone on. And we were accused of being, oh, this the, the typical woke nonsense. It's like, well, hang on a minute. The very definition of the word woke is caring about discrimination that's literally what the word is so yes if that's the case we're a woke formula one podcast we proudly champion people from you know minorities whether that's uh, yeah, not always minorities obviously women as i said people from different races genders sexualities whatever we proudly champion those in the sport uh, and, and the reason we do that is because a great example of just last week we had bernie collins on the fast and the curious who is uh, and she's regular on f1 explains too might not know any mean any a name might not mean anything to people who are only casual fans but she was a strategist at Aston Martin um for years yes. and she's incredible she is very good yeah I did I went to a event with Sky not long ago um a few weeks ago and she was there um talking on the stage and, and she was like that I think that as well really really inspired me to like just look more into the sport because she was just so knowledgeable and she came across so well and she just knew her stuff and and all of her peers and everyone around her really really respected her and that just made me so happy well in terms of a communicator we've never had an F1 on the broadcast side of things she's done you know like we said Netflix of communicators it so effectively but we've never had someone from a strategist because mm-hmm. not everyone's a good broadcaster you know we've never had someone from a strategist perspective come on the telly come on podcasts and give such insight she gives phenomenal insight because she's a brilliant communicator she's a brilliant broadcaster and she's a phenomenal motor racing mind mm. she's also a woman that's completely irrelevant but you know that's brilliant that's absolutely brilliant and and you know we want to show and you the thing is you're missing out on talent if you if you you know all of these f1 teams want to be the best they can possibly be mm. And if you aren't putting people like Bernie on the television, you're having, you know, 12, 13, 14 year old girls who think, actually, I'm really interested in the numbers and the strategy, and I really like F1 because my siblings are watching it, whatever, and I want to do that. You want to show people that it's possible. That's why I do Racing yeah. Pride. So you just want to show that it's possible. And if you have got a, a whole section of society who don't believe it's possible to enter a thing, then you're going to narrow your talent pool. Yeah. So, yeah, so w- in that sense, both podcasts are very proudly woke. You know, we, we we champion people who have not always had the luxury mm-hmm. of just being granted access to the sport because historically sport as a whole hasn't been as brilliant towards women and gay people and people from different races. So, yes, I, I replied to a lot of people on Instagram saying, yes, in that case, this podcast is very woke and if you don't want to listen to it, Go and listen to something mm-hmm. else because we don't care at all. We're, mm-hmm. That's sort of proudly what we do. 
No, I say it, run it back to all being straight with rich white men personally. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 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 it was that's, better in those that's days, what I wasn't like. it? It was. Uh, rich old bald men, ideally. <laughs> and, that's just, and just that. That's what you want. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's just, just circle back again because we're, we're rattling through this. And I could talk to you about Formula One. I could talk to you about your job for, for hours. Mm. Let's talk about video games for a minute. Yes. Now, I know that one of your things that you like to do, in uh, same as me and same as Harry, within your busy schedule, um, lots of people like to watch TV, lots of people like to play sport, whatever it is, to cool off, to chill out, to relax after a busy week. You like to play games like me, right? I do, yes. What, what was your go-to game when you were younger, and what is it now? Okay, so when we were younger, uh, the, the simple answer to that, uh, when I was younger, was Mario games. You're a Nintendo head, and right? Now, like yeah, me. and now is Mario games. That hasn't really changed. Yeah. I play very few games. I play the Mario games... And I play F1, surprisingly, and I play FIFA. That's pretty much it. I've, I, I've done Spyro and things like that, yeah. a few other 3D sort of platform games, but I don't play many games. Um, but, you know, when when streaming first started to become a bigger thing, mm-hmm. I was one of those people, only briefly, that went, why are people watching people play games? This is madness. Like, what's this about? Then it took me back to when I was, and this is one of my, and will always be a very fond childhood memory. We had, we now like, we didn't have loads of money as, as you know, we weren't from a poor background, but we certainly didn't have loads of money. Uh, so my uncle John, for my cousin James, gave us his Super Nintendo, yeah. and it was like, oh my god, this is unbelievable. So then one Christmas, and it was like me, me and my brother got a Nintendo sixty four, and my brother was very young, it was like a joint present, and it was like. Oh my God, didn't think we'd ever be able to afford this. This is unbelievable. And for several nights in a row, my dad was a police officer and he'd come home from work and we'd sometimes have to wait because he was a copper and he was busy, you know, and an actual (laughs) job. So like seven at night and we're up a bit later than we should be because of school. And we would watch him go from level to level on Super Mario 64, which I will always firmly believe is the greatest video game ever made. And we would be sat watching him. Because, uh, you know, my mum was rubbish at games, bless her. I was too young. My brother was too young. Dad was sort of the only one with the ability to go from level to level. You had to collect 120 stars, and I could get about 30, then it was too difficult. So we'd, me, my brother, and my mum would on the floor sit fixated and watch Dad complete the games. And, I, and that was what made me passionately mm-hmm. fall in love with Mario. And, of course, what was I doing? I was doing... the thing of streaming at the time you know yeah and so mario has always been a massive thing for me and it's escapism at its purest in my yeah. opinion it's just yeah. the, the 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 world it creates the the mushroom kingdom the characters it's just phenomenal escapism um so i love the mario games and then also and of course racing so there was the mario kart which of course i still think the greatest racing game of yeah. all time are you speaking to the greatest Mario Kart player of all time? So. I do not doubt that at all. I genuinely <laughs> doubt. I'm not brilliant at it. I'm, I'm really not that great. But then, um, uh, mental health has been a thing for me over the years. I, I take antidepressants. It's, it's something that I have to manage. I always have to manage. I'm in a really great place nowadays with it. I manage it well. But it's one of the tools I use when my brain's overactive. And this is where the F1 game's really helpful. Because with the F1 game, like with real life racing... You take your mind off it for a split second, you're in the wall. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't hurt as much on the PlayStation as it does in real life. I can assure you that's a positive. But when my brain's overactive, you know, driving 50 laps of Silverstone and concentrating on apex after apex after apex, it's phenomenal for my mental health. It, right. it, I need, I'm the sort of person that needs to sometimes sit with my emotions and feel them a little bit and let them out, and that's fine. And sometimes I need to distract myself. Mm-hmm. And gaming is one of the best ways. And it's why, I bet you've talked about this in the past, but I used to work with a guy called Stefan Powell, who was the BBC's gaming reporter for a long time, a brilliant, wonderful man. And um, he was a brilliant champion at the BBC for... And it wasn't just the BBC that were guilty of it, for sort of fighting the lazy coverage of gaming. That, look, you know the whole thing of why aren't kids out getting yep. fresh air? What are they doing on PlayStation games? Well, actually, they can do both. Yes, fresh air is important. Exercise is important. But gaming is brilliant for your mental health as well. And I used to you know, rant about that with Stefan a lot. So, yeah, Stefan's one of those people that's properly helped shape 
the way sort of the media covers gaming mm-hmm. in this country because it's brilliant for your mental health. And my brother as well uh, should be. I'm into my games, you know, but my brother's a different level. Yeah. And he, he streams, he, he stopped for a bit, he's just got back into it. He absolutely, he's got one of those insane computers that lights up and, and it's just, <laughs> ridi- honestly, it's ridiculous. They all light up now, don't they? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> honestly, yeah, but that, uh, it's camp as anything, you should see it. It's got pictures, <laughs> there's pictures in the computer, he can change this. Oh, yeah, I've got one of those. They're oh, cool. it's insane, I'm sure awesome. it That is where it, I've got a PlayStation, so anything beyond that just baffles right. me. But yeah, he's got a better bloody podcast set up than me for his yeah. streaming. I'm a podcast presenter. So yeah, Kizogram, if you want to follow him on the platforms, I can, can I give him a plug? <laughs> of course I, I you can. can. Yeah, Kizogram, <laughs> yeah. he'll like I've done this. Um, so yeah, and he, he's into the Call of Duty and, and yeah. shooting us, which I've never been to, with the exception of GoldenEye on Nintendo 64, the only shooting game I ever played. But So yeah, it's in our blood, it's in our family. My dad loves it. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a select gaming fan, but I'm a gaming fan nonetheless, yeah. Right, as we start to wrap things up here, we've got a game that we play with all of our guests called Survival Mode. Now, chances are I know which one of the two games this is going to be, so I don't know if it's going to work, but we'll do it anyway. So Survival Mode is you wake up tomorrow morning and you are in the last game you played. How are you going to survive? So is the last game you played Formula 1 or was it a Mario game? No. Or was it a mobile game? Great show. Uh, Hang on. (laughs) I went through, I, I also, another thing with my gaming is I go through real patches. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I, I'll have a real bit for it, then I won't game for two or three months. Yeah. I've probably not been on the PlayStation since January. Mm. And in then I was in a massive F1. Yeah. So it would have been F1. It would have been F1 career mode. Because that's another thing I well, don't. Well, he'd do pretty well then, wouldn't he? So, well, if you're actually in it, do you think you could survive? Could you? No. How many laps could you complete before crashing? I guess is the question. I'm not. <laughs> A physical, physically strong enough to survive in a Formula One car. So, what's the question I'm being asked? How could I how, survive? How in the would, game? You, would you just pack up and like just? <laughs> I would pootle around at the back. Yeah. For, I'd, I'd so in F1 career mode, I'd get given the drive. I'd go out on track. Very quickly, someone would realise they'd made a horrible mistake. <laughs> I would. I physically wouldn't be able to get the car to go quick enough because it's such a physical challenge. And my racing career would be over and it would be very humiliating. And I'd never even go into broadcasting because I was that bad. People say they've got no right to talk about it. How, it fast, how fast do they usually go? What, how, how, what's like the top speed that an F1 car would go? About at the, the top speed now is, is between sort of 210 and 214 miles an hour. That's wild. And it's not just the top speed. It's then take a track like Azerbaijan, Baku. They will break from that speed down to 20 miles per hour. Crazy in an unbelievably short distance mm-hmm. where the G-forces are like three or four times that of an Alton Towers roller coaster. So if I you put in six... survive two seconds. If, you, if, if six Gs go through your head and neck, it no, means your head and neck is six times heavier than it would normally be and that's going through. So I can't not... even go on the stealth at Thorpe Park and that only goes yeah. 80. So. <laughs> so it would, in answer to your question, it would break me, I think. It would right. quite quickly break me. And uh, yeah, I, I'll never drive an F1 car, which is very sad because you have to physically, like, it is what they do is superhuman. Mm. So like, but that's a real con- misconception. People think I could just go in and drive an F1 yeah. car. But yeah, it's it's, it's not easy. Um, there's levels. There's, there's levels. levels. There's levels. There's levels. Um, Christian, let's wrap this up. What I want you to do is mm. I want you to thank whoever you want to thank, and uh, if yes. you want to do that, and also tell That's us where we can find you. Yeah, yeah, where we can find you. All right. Well, let me thank two people in particular. Uh, I, you know, my parents were always amazing with backing me. What everyone wants to do with F1 with media, so they they're the obvious. But we, as we've spoken about getting to do what you sort of want to do, two people who really believed in me. Was Greg James? Yep, of Radio Fame, my celebrity friend. He <laughs> properly believed that I could do an F one podcast, and we started one together. And a guy called Chris Browning, who is F one's head of podcasts, Chris, podcast editor. He runs the podcast. I don't know his title. <laughs> They're the two people that came to me with, "You should do F one podcast." So I I owe a huge amount to those two individuals. So thanks, Greg and Chris. And the second question was. Where can we Where find you? Find you? Uh, you, you can find, find me on uh, TikTok and Instagram. Just search Christian Hugill and Twitter if that if you're still on that on that dying platform now. Uh, <laughs> and if you want to find the podcast, they are the Fast and the Curious, which you can now watch on YouTube as well as on all the podcast platforms. And F1 explains. I once saw Greg James in a queue outside <laughs> of Blue's Kitchen, a, a bar in was it? He was at the Shoreditch or Camden, and he was lovely. He is lovely. He's so when you 
Greg's a friend, you know. I, I, I think I'm qualified to say that. So when you're when you're friends with a celebrity, you get asked a lot. What's a, insert name of celebrity here like? That's probably you get the it question. a lot with me as well. Don't I do yes. all the time, yeah. all the time. So that's probably the question I get asked. Well, what's Greg James like? Uh, and he's a terrible man. Awful, <laughs> really? Aggressive. No, it, 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 Greg is um, a genuinely very. You and Greg share sort of excited Labrador puppy tendencies like you definitely he definitely yeah <laughs> the, you're both very excited about the world around you you and greg would get on very well yeah so he's a he's a lovely man and i'm grateful to him christian well it's been fantastic to be as well. thank you to you guys it's been, I've had <laughs> no a thank you time. thank you for coming on i feel like i've learned a lot you've spoken so eloquently about oh, nice. everything that you do so thank you so much it's been very very enjoyable yeah. Um, and, and I think we'll wrap it up. And yeah. it's a great podcast. I was listening yesterday as well. To the last episode. <laughs> thank oh, you. Well thank you. Try. We have on some great guests, you know. We do. <laughs> we, yeah, we do. We do. Christian, keep dominating the F1 world. Keep doing your podcasts and uh, keep waving the flag as well. I'll have a go. I'll keep trying. Thank you, guys. All right, man. And we'll thank see you in the guys. next one. Bye. Bye. Bye.